this is a, a, a really terrific school meeting we're going to have, and it's an honor for me to make this introduction. You should know, and, and you may not, that we have an, uh, an award that's given, and it's the highest award that the school gives to an alumni. It's called the Horace Dutton Taft Alumni Medal. It is, as I said, the, the finest honor that the school bestows on a graduate. And it's a, uh, led by a committee uh, which looks at the landscape of extraordinary achievement by alumni. And then after considerable deliberation, they make a selection. They select that graduate whose life has really embodied the school motto, not to be served, but to serve. No more would city administrator or said it in the spread. And when you think about this, and you think about the amazing lives that alumni, Catholic alumni lead, uh, to receive this award is extraordinary. Um, the school model surrounds us. Uh, I speak about it often. You see it etched in stone. You see it etched in, in glass and wood. It's on the letterhead when you write a letter. Um, it's in the air we breathe, and it's something we talk about all the time. And thousands of alumni, in, in big and small ways, live out that motto. And I, hope, I fervently hope that you will as well. But it is hard to think of someone who is more deserving than Joyce Poole, who is the class of 1974, and you will meet in a moment. And I would say as a, as a Taft graduate and as a passionate outdoorsman, as a kind of amateur naturalist, I've always been fascinated by her work. I've admired it, and it's a real honor to introduce her. I, I could recite a long list of her achievements, um, but I'll edit and I'll begin with this, that there is no one in the world who has thought more creatively and researched more robustly into the lives of elephants, in particular into, into the communication and emotions that they have. No one has done this more effectively, and she this is one of the most important conservationists in the world. Uh, Joyce Poole has changed about the way we think about a particular species, and indeed she's changed the way we think about ourselves. If you want to get lost in the fascinating world of elephants, and my guess is you're going to be even more interested after this morning, of the kind of emotional trauma that the elephants have, of the collective memory that they have, of the ways in which they socialize. Go YouTube her work and you'll, you'll be lost. Joyce grew up on this campus. She was a faculty brat, if you will. Her father was a faculty member, Taft graduate, and a great teacher. And then, of course, uh, the legendary conservationist after whom our pool grants are named. She graduated with a BA from Smith and PhD from Cambridge. She did postdoc work at Princeton. And from there, she began her life's work in Kenya and Mozambique. And her research and advocacy helped bring about a deeper understanding of a species that has incredible intelligence and emotional complexity, brought about a ban on the ivory trade, the ending of cruel treatment of elephants and circuses, and also changes in conservation policy and law. And above all, what she has asked, implicitly and explicitly, is that we should think about the ethical obligations we have as a people, as a species, on this planet. Hers is a voice that I think is deeply needed, um, urgently uh, relevant today, and one which has made our world a better place. After her remarks, she'll be in the faculty room if you'd like to come up and introduce yourself or, or be there for some Q&A. And I just would uh, end by saying, please give a warm welcome to this year's recipient of the Horace Dutton Taft Alumni Medal, Joyce Poole, Class of 1974. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Willie. That was um, that was incredible. Thank you. It is quite something to be back here and standing up here um, instead of where where you're where you're sitting. <laughs> but I remember it well. In fact, um, I have to say that I remember very clearly sitting just about there when Lance Auden. Uh, looked at me very pointedly, as he had a way of doing, and said to the entire school that the leader of the 11 girls who streaked naked around Congdon Dormitory had for and in front of the pho photographers from the papyrus had forgotten to pull the stocking down over her face. <laughs> um, and that was a way of putting the uh, trend of streaking to an end. And it, it worked. <laughs> I was mortified. So, <laughs> now, 
Now, um, I'm not a very serious person, but I am going to give a, a quite a serious uh, talk today. But I've been thinking back on Taft a lot since I learned about this award. And although I was only here, sadly, for one year, my senior year, Taft holds very um, warm, and I have very fond memories of Taft because, as Willie pointed out, I came here uh, when I was a few months old um, and spent the first six years of my life here as a, I think they call it a faculty brat. Um, I also have fond memories of being a student at Taft. I had very inspiring teachers and I made important lifelong friendships. It's fair to say that I mostly look back on that year as being one full of endless pranks and laughter, but I believe that I worked hard as well. And my favorite subject, as a matter of fact, was not science but was studio art. And Mark Potter was my favorite teacher. He encouraged and inspired me and I looked forward to every minute in his class. And while my life has been dedicated to science and conservation, I have a studio at home and I still paint. And these days I love to paint elephants and I paint elephants to depict their beauty and their personalities. And this is um, Echo and Erin. You may have, some of you may have heard of the famous um, elephant Echo, and I studied her for many years. Um, this is Provocadora, a new um, acquaintance of mine from Gorongosa. And I also paint their uh, experiences I've had with them. For instance, the uh, famous eight-minute chase, part of which is depicted on PBS uh, uh, charge, I should say, by 36 elephants of the Mabenzi family. Um, and I paint uh, other memories I've had, experiences I've had. This was a, um, an incident that Selenge witnessed, my daughter witnessed as a baby, where um, an elephant had killed a person and the Maasai retaliated by spearing ten elephants. Um, the elephants retaliated by throwing one of the Maasai about uh, 10 meters. And I paint memories of childhood, memories of driving through um, the bush at night and coming across, say, an angry group of elephants. So I sometimes paint the threats elephants face and, and, and I paint sometimes to release the pain and anger I feel about the way that they're treated. I am probably a little eccentric, but it was many years before I accepted that studying elephants and working for their concert pr protection was what other people might call my career. I had a passion and it was elephants. My love for elephants and for the work that I do has sustained me to this day. And I feel so very fortunate. I wake up every day excited about what I'm going to do in my office, whether it be in the field or at the computer. So I know that you guys have to study hard to get good grades, to get into a good university, to get a good job with a good salary. But along your path, don't forget that to really thrive, to really do well, to be happy, you need to believe in what you do, enjoy what you do, even love it. Jobs can be a slog, and you have many years ahead of you, and you must, um, ded that you must dedicate to one. So as you make your decisions about what you're going to do, give some time to think thinking outside the box, being creative, and listening to your heart. I want to tell you a little bit about elephants and my life with them. But before I do, I want to introduce you to some family members, uh, to mention them and to th thank them. First of all, my wonderful Norwegian husb husband and colleague, Peter Granli, who founded, co-founded Elephant Voices with me and has worked by my side for the last 17 years. And to our daughter, Selenge, who's here today, uh, and grew up watching elephants with me and listening to me talk about them endlessly. Thank you for being 
such a great companion. My cinematographer brother, Bobby, um, with whom I've made a number of elephant films for National Geographic and PBS. I'll be sharing some of um, the clips of his work to demonstrate elephant behavior, and we've had just so much fun working together. My lovely sister and Taft alumna, Ginny, is also here today, um, and she has really been our family anchor. Thank you, Ginny. And of course, my parents, my mother and father, were intrepid adventurers who loved animals and the great outdoors, and they were my role models. My father was a student at Taft from 1948 to 1950. He was captain of the baseball and football teams. He was a school monitor. And he returned as a teacher and coach in 1956, in the year that I was born. When I was six years old, my brother three and my sister, just six weeks old, we moved to Africa for the first of many times. And my fondest memories um, are of family, <laughs> family time camping in the bush, observing wild animals, and making discoveries. At the age of 11, I went to a lecture about chimpanzees at the National Museums of Kenya in Nairobi, and given by a young woman named Jane Goodall. And after she spoke, I told my mother that I was going to study animals when I grew up, too. It seemed to me a perfectly natural thing to do. I began studying elephants the year after I graduated from Taft, taking a year off from college to return to Africa with my family, where my father had just been given the, the job of being director of the African Wildlife Foundation in Nairobi. I studied, I studied elephants in Amboseli, Kenya, with Cynthia Moss, who became both mentor and friend to me. She put me in charge then of getting to know the adult male elephants in a project that's now in its 45th year. It's one of the longest studies of individually known animals in the world. I'm rather single-minded, and elephants became my obsession. I got to know them as individuals, their age, their sex, their families. I documented every ear notch and tear. I described how they behaved and kept notes on their relationships. Each elephant had a personality. Each was unique. I gave them names. Here are a few I want to introduce you to from where we're currently studying in Gorongosa. This is <coughs> Junia. This is Valente leading that famous eight minute charge, group charge. This is Valda, another very powerful matriarch. And this is Aloisio. As an undergraduate, at Smith College, I spent holidays in Africa observing elephants. I watched as adult males went through dramatic personality changes. And these observations led to my discovery that male African elephants have a sexual cycle with a heightened period of sexual and aggressive behavior known as must. It's an Urdu word meaning intoxicated and it hadn't been noticed in African elephants before. I documented, I documented must behavior as an undergraduate. I went on to describe the patterns of must um, as for my PhD at Cambridge, and then I went even in further detail as a postdoc at Princeton University. This is Little Male. He's been known since he was a baby when he was given the name in a typical must display in which I've marked some of the behaviors that I've described as they appear in the video. And I filmed this on my iPhone uh, last year in Amboseli. He was 
pretty close. He's not small. <laughs> I studied the behavior of individuals as well as the overarching long-term patterns to learn how elephants might cope with anthropogenic threats. For example, I found that male elephants do not reach uh, their reproductive prime until they're between 40 and 50 years old, by which time most of them have already died, either killed by people who are after their beautiful ivory, trophy hunters who assume that these old males are reproductively senile, poachers wanting to make a buck, or killed by irate farmers who are tired of having them uh, destroying their crops. It's taken Tim 48 years to reach this magnificence, and he's been treated multiple times for wounds inflicted by people. Males in must, and he's in must there, produce a very low frequency pulsating call that sounds like water gurgling through a deep tunnel. I'll play you a must rumble now. I hope your chair shook a little bit. And that's because of these very low frequencies. Documenting this particular call led to the discovery that elephants are capable, capable of producing sounds um, with frequencies below the level of human hearing. And some of these are so powerful that they can be heard by elephants kilometers away. It helped to explain the coordinated movement of distant groups of elephants. Calls like the ones I'm going to play now that are used to recruit family members who are under, um, distant family members when a group of elephants is under threat, in this case by a lion. Sorry, I should have turned that earlier. Scary. I mean, this is how they also greet, making sounds like this. And you can feel you're about to be under attack when all they're doing is saying hello to one another. Early on in my career, I had a couple of experiences that gave me pause. One day I was coming back from the field and I met Tony standing out on the plane alone over a stillborn infant. And she was trying to lift the infant using her trunk and her feet and her tusks. And finally, she just stood there very dejectedly with her head hanging down, her mouth was turned down. And you know, she looked like she was grieving. She looked completely different to me than a normal elephant. And after she stood there for two days defending her calf from predators and without food and water. So on the second day, I took a jerry can and a basin of water and I went out and at first she charged me like she'd been doing the other predators. But then I backed off a little bit and I put the basin out on the ground and I began pouring from the jerry can, standing outside of the car. And she came rushing over and she drank as I poured with her tusks not two inches from my head. And afterwards she reached into the car and she touched me on my chest. In, in a gesture that I felt was a thank you. So on that day, um, I had the distinct feeling that she experienced complex emotions in a way that I might have. That both grief and gratitude were part of her emotional makeup. And our later work would show that elephants, like people, are capable of empathizing with others. In the same year, I witnessed Polly die. Three males found her immediately afterwards and spent an hour trying to lift her, using their trunk and their feet and their tusks. One of the males uh, was, a, was a, a guy named Kasaini. Later, after the males had left her and given up, I drove off to the rangers to tell them that an elephant had died so they could come and hack out her tusks 
to keep them from falling into the wrong hands. Two days later, I came back to her carcass and was so surprised to see three males standing over her, her body. One of them, Kasaini, the same male. And they were particularly focused on her face, on her bloodied face, where the rangers had hacked out her tusks and they were sniffing it and sniffing toward me. And I came to the unsettling realization that they had an understanding of death and that they knew that humans had cut out her face. Our later experiments have shown that elephants are able to discriminate between people of different genders, ethnic groups, who represent different levels of threat to them. Knowing individual elephants and their relationships to one another helped me to understand their subtle and not so subtle postures, gestures, and calls. And as part of our educational outreach, Petter and I have built online databases to document elephant behavior, to which we're now adding video. Here's an example with annotated behavior and calls as demonstrated by Nalakite and her begging, nagging sons. She behaves much like any mother would. details on the lives of individual elephants has been a kind of formula in my work. Understanding their many calls and gestures has eventually meant that I can follow as elephants communicate a course of action to navigate our dangerous human landscapes, negotiate where to spend the day, build a consensus to attack us, or on one occasion announce to one another and so to me, that a baby elephant was about to be born. It's also led me to contemplate what elephants are capable of reflecting upon, themselves, others, us, and the world about them. The insight gained has been a sort of moral compass in my work. In the late 1980s and until 1997, South Africa still rounded up elephants by, with helicopters and shot the adults for ivory and sold their babies to zoos to establish or to establish new populations of elephants in reserves. The drug of choice was scoline, which paralyzed the adult elephants but left them fully cognizant as men walked among them, shooting them. Calves were tied to their dead mothers as they were butchered. At the time, no one gave a thought to how those little elephants might feel, nor that the long nor that the long-term repercussions of trauma and of growing up without love and affection would lead to aberrant behavior among both captive elephants in zoos and wild individuals. The legal market in ivory was fueling illegal poaching, and by 1987, Kenya had already lost 85% of its elephants. As many argued for the continued harvesting of elephants, I was incensed that people could turn a blind eye to the suffering of these individuals, treating them as if they were just so many body parts for sale. But as a young woman, in a man's world, I was told that my arguments were emotional and had no place in wildlife management. That was like a red rag to a bull. I knew I had the facts, I would gather more, and I would argue my case scientifically. 
1989, with financial support from a Taft friend, Paul Klingenstein, I carried out surveys on poached elephant populations. The numbers were shocking. Almost no adult males were left. High proportions of tuskless adult females, other females no longer reproducing, orphaned calves, leaderless families, and terrified elephants. The social fabric of these populations was almost destroyed. And these data became part of the proposal that helped to close the international trade in ivory in 1989. The ivory trade ban held for 10 years until South African countries were permitted an experimental sale of ivory to Japan in 1999 and another to China and Japan in 2008. This mixed messaging of a so-called ban that was legally in place, but with possible sales, opened the floodgates to another wave of slaughter. More than 30,000 elephants a year since about 2011. And we're still trying to stem the bloodletting. But for me, it isn't just about the numbers and the possible extinction of a species. It's also about the individual lives, the building blocks of society. Since 2011, my husband and I have had a project in Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, where I'm feeling a sense of deja vu. Between 1974 and 1992, Gorongosa was the epicenter of Mozambique's civil war, where battles played out uh, between Frelimo and Renamo, the two opposing sides. 90% of Gorongosa's elephants were killed, and their ivory was exchanged for arms and ammunition. A quarter of a century on from that time, and the physical and psychological scars from that war are still visible on individuals their families, and the whole social structure. The adult sex ratio is highly skewed. More than half of the adult females are tuskless, and there are bullet holes in ears. Gorongosa's elephants are reclusive and aggressive toward people, mobbing, attacking, and even tipping over vehicles. Learn behavior that's passed down from mother to daughter. Culture. Gorongos is being restored with the help of an American philanthropist, Greg Carr, and a great team of people. It is a conservation success story that gives us hope, but it's also a poignant reminder that elephants are long-lived, highly social, intelligent animals. And when it comes to Mother Nature, including climate, we can't just fix what we break. When I was a child, there were 9.5 million people and at least 200,000 elephants in Kenya. Today, there are five times the number of people and one-tenth the number of elephants. In the immediate vicinity of Masai Mara, where Peter and I have also been working since 2012, the human population is growing at 10% per year and conflict with elephants over resources is escalating. I know that my life and my work may sound exotic and exciting, but, and it is, but battles in conservation are hard won, and there's plenty of pain that comes with all the losses. I feel an urgency to document the beauty of what exists out there, to share what we've learned, and to describe what's at stake if we don't change course. But I feel hope, too. The conservation community in Kenya is now run by dynamic, passionate young Kenyans. And with the advent of email, the internet, and social media, teamwork spans continents and can involve hundreds, even thousands of people. Collaboratively, we take scientific arguments to the media and make films to meetings with public officials and stop culling, save habitat and corridors, burn ivory stockpiles, 
and even closed domestic ivory, ivory markets. We write affidavits and appear in court when necessary, stopping circuses and zoos from exhibiting elephants and opening sanctuaries for them instead. Two steps forward and one step back, but public perception and policy has changed. After I was told about that I had been selected as the 2017 recipient of the Horace Dutton Taft Medal, I naturally reflected on Taft's motto, to serve, not to be served. I'd always assumed that motto uh, meant a service to people. So I'm so delighted that this award is in recognition of a service to those other individuals, those other persons, and efforts to bring mainstream <coughs> acceptance of their rights to be here on this planet too. A right to resources and space to roam, a right to liberty and freedom from persecution. <clears throat> this month, you may well hear about a case being brought to the courts by the Non-Human Rights Project that will make an argument for legal personhood and the fundamental right to bodily liberty for elephants. The case will argue that common law courts must free these self-aware, autonomous beings to appropriate sanctuaries, not out of concern for their welfare, though there is concern for that, but out of respect for their rights. The affidavits of five elephant biologists, including mine, make up the argument for the case. Neither the public nor the courts may be ready for such an argument, but in 2017, we actually have the evidence to make it. That's something to contemplate, and elephants likely do. Elephants understand from age three what it means to serve, not to be served. And they do so with the utmost caring, dedication, and loyalty for the rest of their lives. I never tire of observing them, of being in their compassionate, empathetic company, and watching their seamless teamwork. I do believe that the world would be a kinder and better place if people were more like elephants and less like primates. I know that through the Robert Keyes Pool Environmental Fellowships established in my father's name, some of you have been able to travel and contribute your service toward protecting our planet. I am so glad and thank you so much for your service. I want to leave you with something to think about. Being students at Taft, you are at an elite school. If you allow yourself to view your situation from a world perspective, you are extraordinarily privileged. You are the creme de la creme. Graduating from Taft automatically gives you yet another leg up. It brings with it possibilities that others don't have, if you use them well. But your elite education, your privilege, also comes with responsibilities, duties, to serve, not to be served. Our earth as we know it, and our very existence on it, is hanging in the balance now. Institutions like Taft, are shaping tomorrow's leaders, you. And we are dependent on you to try and sort out the excesses of my generation. I know that some of you will rise to this challenge. Thank you so much.